good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast and good morning, I guess, the further west you go. Um, welcome to this Cato Institute Book Forum. My name is Ryan Bourne. I occupy the R. Evan Shaft Chair for the Public Understanding of Economics here at Cato. And I guess most importantly for today's conversation, I'm the author of uh, Cato's most recently released book, Economics in One Virus, An Introduction to Economic Reasoning Through COVID-19, uh, which is now available for purchase both on the Cato store um, on Amazon and in many other good bookstores and no doubt some bad ones too. Um, my book really attempts to harness the case study of the pandemic to introduce um, those uninitiated to the subject to economics itself. But in doing that and contextualizing a lot of the major public policy decisions we've seen through the pandemic on everything from lockdowns to, to FDA regulations, I think it offers an implicit critique of where policymakers might have erred from good economic economic thinking um, and explains how those decisions might have led to more deaths, lost liberties and foregone economic output than was perhaps necessary. But rather than just talk about the book, we wanted to hold an event with a more open discussion of the extent to which economics has or hasn't informed uh, policy well in this pandemic, uh, to look at what we've learned from economics uh, from this pandemic and think about how well those lessons will be internalized for future crises. And to do that, I'm joined by uh, truly three of the best commentators, intellectuals and economists who've been working on this beat over the past year. Uh, so just to introduce them uh, briefly, Alex Tabarrok is the Bartley J. Madden Chair in Economics at the Mercator Center at George Mason University. Um, you may know him as one of the co-authors of the popular economics blog, Marginal Revolution. And during this pandemic, he's worked with a group of economists, including Nobel Prize winner Michael Kramer, in advising governments and the World Bank on vaccine policy. Now, for anyone who's been following Alex through this pandemic, you know that he's been way ahead of the curve um, in many of his, his policy proposals, uh, particularly in thinking about the costs and benefits of medical product regulation and, and innovation, and on ways to accelerate or speed up uh, vaccine rollout. So we're you know, very grateful you're with us today, Alex. Megan McArdle um, probably needs no introduction for a Cato audience. She's a columnist for the Washington Post, where she writes about business, economics, and public policy. She's previously written for The Economists and Bloomberg. Uh, Megan has written about a host, of art a host of different topics during this pandemic and hasn't been afraid on occasion to leave her libertarian comfort zones when it came to pandemic relief, and more recently when thinking about the role of government in preparing for crises. And if you haven't listened to her appearance on uh, Russ Roberts's Econ Talk, that really is a must listen. And finally, um, John Cochran is the Rosemary and Jack Anderson Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. He's the author of the blog, The Grumpy Economist, but whenever I see him, he always seems to be smiling. So I think that's ironic. Um, and he appears on a fantastic Hoover podcast with Neil Ferguson and HR McMaster called Goodfellows which really has been a must listen again through this pandemic. Uh, John's writing on lockdowns, the limits of epidemiological models, uh, the fiscal response to this crisis and vaccine rollouts have been both informative and, and chastening for, for public officials and, and for readers alike. Now, rather than have opening statements, we're just gonna have a, a conversation right from the off, um, but there are plenty of opportunities for you guys to get involved at home. You can submit your questions via the Cato Institute website down the, the side of the, um, of the live stream video. You can submit questions via Facebook, Twitter, um, and, and YouTube too, wherever it makes most sense for you. And um, I'll, I'll get them and try to integrate them into the conversation. But given we've only got uh, 54 minutes left, let, let's jump right in. In the New York Times last week, um, Columnist Ezra Klein asked the question we're all asking ourselves right now, which is, is Alex Tabarrok right? And what I think he meant by that was, are people dying because our coronavirus response is too cautious when it comes to thinking about the risks associated with medical innovation? Alex, in that article, you're described as a thorn in the side of public health experts. Um, but I see your critique of their actions really primarily, I guess, as an economic one. You know, what do you think is the most fundamental economic error that has undermined our ability to confront this pandemic? Well, there were a lot. And 
let me say to begin with that I never th saw myself as sort of opposing the epidemiologists or anything uh, like that. And in fact, there were many of them who were excellent. Uh, Robert Wachter uh, was excellent. Uh, Michael Mina uh, was excellent. Uh, Mark Lipschitz. So I, I'm, I was a thorn in the side of some of them, but uh, I didn't, that was not my goal. And uh, many of them were great. Um, I'm not sure what the most fundamental was, but uh, this is maybe a good opportunity to talk about something which I haven't talked about very much, which I think was important. And that is this. Most people think that when you have a situation of great uncertainty, that you should stick with the status quo, right? So uh, better the devil you know than the devil you don't. The status quo seems safe and stable. Uh, but as the deer kind of frozen in headlights uh, example uh, suggests, this is not always the case. Uh, indeed, the more uncertainty, the more uncertainty there is, uh, the really more you should deviate from the status quo. Okay, now why is this? Well, because if you stick with the status quo, you don't learn anything. You don't learn anything. Uh, and you have to deviate in order to learn. And particularly when you have a lot of uncertainty and a chance to uh, reverse your decision, this means that uh, when you have this uncertainty, this is the time to explore, to have experimentation, right? So in, in, uh, in supporting uh, first doses first, right? Delaying the second dose. We could have reversed that decision. That wouldn't have been great. That would have been costly, of course. You don't want to have to changed too many times. Nevertheless, the fact that the decision was reversible means that this was a real opportunity to learn something. And people sort of accused me of, you know, you're promoting all of these risky policies. And my response was, I'm, promote, I'm promoting learning policies. If you stick with the status quo, you don't learn anything. In order to learn, you have to take some risk. Uh, and so I think that was a, the, the idea that we had to explore, that we had to learn, that we had to take some chances, I think was really uh, underappreciated. And to this extent, we really ought to be lauding uh, the British uh, and the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunization, because the British took the risk of delaying the second dose and the entire world got the benefit. Right. So I think actually there's an interesting externality there that we don't take enough risks. We don't uh, because no one wants to take the risk, but everybody wants the learning. And the British have provided us with an incredibly important amount of uh, learning. And so you need to take risk and learning go hand in hand when there is a crisis, when there is uncertainty. And so this also illustrates the importance of speed, not just speed in making one decision, but you have to make, in a situation like a pandemic, you have to make a decision, you have to learn from that decision, and then you have to start the do loop right over again. How do you adjust? How do you adjust? We didn't do either of these things very well. We didn't choose quickly in the United States. We didn't learn. The British, I think, did much better. Yeah, I think there's a few different issues there intertwined. But as you kind of alluded to at the end, one is that with a disease that does spread uh, so quickly that early action if you experiment and get things right really can mitigate the spread of the disease um, quite rapidly um, and one thing that I've kind of been um, conscious of when I've seen some of what I consider the mistakes in this pandemic is that a lot of the regulatory decisions almost seem to fail to define the kind of counterfactual of what would happen absent the decision being made um, John, you've been really sharply critical of the FDA on, on testing regulations in that regard. From an economic perspective, what kind of error do you see them making? Because we've seen, you know, we've seen the delays for the um, initial PCR diagnostic tests when it came to the emergency use authorization procedure. Then, of course, we've seen um, uh, inadequacies, perhaps, on the on the rollout of rapid tests. You know, what do you think about the underlying economics of what's going on there? Well, I'll have to admit, this is all a conversation, and, and most of what I know I stole from Alex and, and also a little bit of <laughs> Megan. Uh, so the tests, it was just last week that the FDA and in its infinite wisdom finally said we may use tests uh, without a doctor's prescription in our own home. Yay! 
Uh, <laughs> so I think that illustrates a couple of the phenomena here. Um, we are in a race between bureaucratic bungling and on one side and evolution and exponential growth on the other side. And our bureaucracies are just not really designed uh, to think about situations like that. Um, remember, what, what the state can mostly do is forbid things. <laughs> That's its main tool. And in the case of tests, um, that is what they did. Uh, you, universities early on were able to make their own tests and do them and, and give them to their students. And the uh, FDA forbid them from doing it. <laughs> uh, you're not allowed as a business to... <clears throat> to, to uh, to, to buy tests and test your own employees. And I think, um, you know, why has our, uh, I, we may get to markets and lockdowns and, and things like that, but what we're really talking about is the lack of basic state capacity, the, the lost ability to handle public health in a thoughtful way. Uh, our FDA is set up to uh, stop patent medicine from being uh, sent to people, to not redo thalidomide. Uh, the, the mentality is protect the individual patient and make sure that any drug that they take is absolutely safe, even if, uh, you know, without really cost benefit. That mentality just does not fit the task of stopping an epidemic from spreading where uh, one has to move quickly. And in particular, the, the whole concept of a test is the point of a test that you have a sick person in a hospital and you need to rapidly do two, one of two very dangerous interventions to save that person. And uh, there's, there's no, you know, this is just the disease that's out there, you know, cancer who's been there forever. Uh, so the FDA thinks in that way. Uh, the idea that one could use a test to stop the spread of a disease, that we should be testing people who are completely asymptomatic, just randomly testing people to find out uh, where a disease is and to give information. We don't have to jump to government-imposed lockdowns. Just let us have the information to do our own behavioral changes. Uh, that idea just isn't in how that bureaucracy works. And I think that's the core of uh, many places where our, our bureaucracies completely failed us. Um, I just want to kind of hone in a bit on this uh, testing issue because it has been described by various people as kind of the original sin of um, the pandemic response failures here in the United States. And, and Megan, um, you know, picking up on what John said, you've written um, quite extensively about why testing is you know, shouldn't be thought of as a silver bullet in terms of completely insulating people from risk. And quite often we've heard about concerns about tests missing infected people and hypothetical kind of false positives when the prevalence of the disease is low. And it strikes me as an economist that this kind of all or nothing discussion that people uh, come in, uh, you know, enter into when, when discussing this is kind of uneconomic in that it doesn't think about the, the marginal um, uh, consequences of uh, of having more testing available. Um, in terms of how people like think about risk, what errors do you think um, we've seen in in how people uh, regard this pandemic? So I think that people didn't understand the ways in which testing could have been this incredibly powerful tool that we just basically left on the table. Um, for many of the reasons that, that John and Alex have talked about, you know, the, the bureaucracy just couldn't get out of its own way. It couldn't react to a new situation. It just kept doing the thing it was good at doing. Um, but, you know, at the individual level, the problem with tests is that they have both false positives and false negatives and how many of each depends on the kind of test. But um, so if you kind of just indiscriminately test people, you'll get a lot of false positives. And that can be bad in two ways. One, you know, they think they have COVID, they didn't, they stay home for two weeks and miss something. But the other problem is they think they have COVID, they didn't. And then, and then two weeks later, they're like, ah, I'm immune, I can go out and, and do everything right. Is that if you're going to use them at the population level, you need to educate people about like, look, this doesn't mean that um, you've definitely had COVID and you can just act as if you've definitely had COVID. Um, you're you're going to need to do more tests and, and so forth. Uh, follow up with a more sensitive test, perhaps, or one that has a different balance of false negatives and false positives. Um, but then you have the false negative problem where people don't think they have COVID and they do and they go out and spread it. And so what these tests are actually most useful for is if you can deploy them like really widespread at the population level, People who have who take a test understand that if I get a positive test, I need to quarantine for 10 days. 
but that doesn't mean I had COVID. So I have to keep doing the tests, right? That's kind of a hard lift, I think. But if we had managed to get to that lift and we had had, you know, uh, Paul Romer was talking about just massive testing, right? We could have made a bunch of activities safer and we could have really stomped down on COVID if people had complied with quarantines. I think the risk is that people would have been like, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I get a false positive, I have to quarantine. And that doesn't even mean I'm, I never have to do this again. I have to keep doing it. That could have been a problem. But if we'd managed to get over that lift, I think we could have almost stopped this thing in its tracks if we deployed the testing widely enough. We did not. The FDA wouldn't get out of its own way. Um, you know, the production wasn't there. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, but to do that, you really needed like a kind of state capacity that we just don't have. And I think the thing that has been most disappointing for me throughout all of this has been discovering just how poor our state capacity is, how bad our agencies are at not just running a playbook that was clearly inappropriate to the pandemic we actually had. You saw this over and over and over and over again, where they had something, you know, this is how we do it. You know, we assume that that these respiratory infections are droplet borne. We now know that like basically fomites are not, you know, things on your hand, whatever, are basically not an issue. The deep cleaning is useless. Um, what we needed to be worried about was airborne. We needed to be going early in on masks. And no, they just, we've kept, we've been deep cleaning schools uselessly for a year now, even though it's it's been pretty clear since very early on that the deep cleaning was not actually doing anything. And again, there are real costs to that, not just there's the false positive. I think I've made big progress. And in a lot of ways, the deep cleaning ended up substituting for stuff that actually worked, like installing HEPA filters, right? Um, and so I, I think that the, the biggest shock to me is just how poor our agencies were at doing their job um, and how poor they were about thinking about risk. Right at how poor they were about like kind of trying to do any sort of co cost benefit calculation rather than having these really like elaborate plans that or procedures that they developed in earlier pandemics that they just kept running, even though they were just not useful here. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And um, to kind of tie together one thing that Alex said with what you said, I mean. If, if you get into a situation where you see experimentation around the world, but there's still no kind of incentive or desire to error correct, then you've got a big problem as a, as a state agency. But I just want to pick up on one more thing on, on testing with Alex first, because Alex, you've written about the, uh, the potential use of um, kind of uh, decentralized rapid tests. And I believe you've written about them in, in the context of universities and, and the MBA. Do you think that was ever a viable strategy at a kind of national stage? Well, I think there were two opportunities. Uh, the first opportunity was right at the very beginning, right? So uh, had the CDC test not completely failed and had the FDA uh, not prohibited uh, private firms from making uh, tests, then I think there was actually an opportunity to have many more tests than there were cases, than there were infections, right? Uh, really early on. That's when testing and a little bit of contract taste, uh, testing, contract tracing, uh, can uh, really uh, kind of uh, lock, I don't want to use the term lock you down, but that, that's when it would have been most effective, right? Uh, as we got into the crisis, then testing became you, you have to get many more Morton tests, right? You have to, you, you, you got to always test more than there are cases, right? Uh, so it became more and more difficult uh, to do that. However, we could have done a lot more on making workplaces uh, safe. I mean, it's amazing that we had all of the discussion about the uh, meatpacking plants, right? When actually uh, rapid tests could have solved that uh, problem. Um, the school problem can be solved with uh, rapid testing. You know, we've kept a lot of kids out of school for a year now, and that is going to have consequences for the next 30 or 40 uh, years down the line, quite possibly. And we could have, and we still can uh, to some extent, we could have solved that uh, problem with testing. So, yeah, I think uh, early on, there was a chance to actually stop this thing in its tracks with testing and the FDA and the CDC failed. And then later on, because private tests were not allowed, we were not able to uh, 
create any uh, pockets, uh, such as the meatpacking plant, such as the schools, uh, in which there was lots of testing. It could it could have been done. The NBA did it. The NFL did it. Uh, a few universities, uh, Cornell did it. Uh, some other universities did it. But we could have done it a lot, lot more had there been more support. Yeah, I I, <clears throat> I kind of take a similar line in the book where I say the problem with, with those early failures was it kind of kicked the South Korean option off the table straight away. So um, even though there were opportunities to use the rapid test for a lot of mitigation later on, we'd kind of uh, completely turned over the table on the f potentially the first best kind of most sustainable solution. I know, John, you wanted to come yeah. in on, on testing. Uh, Megan said it right. And we'll, I think we need to say this over and over that the failure of our state capacity, this is basic public health. There were hundreds of pandemic plans out there, which just sat on the shelves, like the last scene from Raiders of the Lost <clears> Ark. <throat> Um, that was the, the CDC was set up to do this sort of stuff. So at the original stage, when it's a public health, when it's a state thing, um, you know, testing, that's how we got rid of smallpox. This is not some new thing. But I want to emphasize just for our listeners, in case we're kind of batting around things that we all know uh, and, and the importance, how could have testing helped so much? Testing is uh, to us. It's a device for slowing the spread of a disease. It does not have to be perfect for that purpose. For the purpose of treating somebody with a very invasive treatment, you need a very good test. And that's why the FDA does its stuff. The purpose we want to put it to is to try to keep this disease from spreading. And it doesn't have to be perfect for that case. The only thing we need, and this is one of the other big failures of our, of our public uh, uh, bureaucracy, you don't have to stop every case of transmission. You just need to get the reproduction rate under one. Each person who has it gives it to less than one other person on average. That's all it takes. And then it goes away. We don't have to have that be absolute zero. So the combination of the public goal is get reproduction under one and the fact that this disease spreads in super spreader events. Most people don't give it to anyone. A couple people go to a bar and give it to 20, 30 people. That means the tests a little bit to, to Megan's, I think, Megan wasn't quite clear enough here. The tests don't have to be perfect for the public health. In fact, we use tests already. Throughout this pandemic, you took your temperature, you filled out these cute little apps. Uh, we did things to try to decide who has it and who did it. We made people quarantine because they traveled. We tried to find groups of people who were more likely to have it and isolate them for more or less. All that a test does, even a very imperfect test, is it allows better information. <clears throat> So there's no reason whatsoever to let even imperfect tests out there. Uh, yes, as a making point, people have to digest. We all kind of know, well, fever, maybe yes, maybe no, uh, but that people aren't that dumb. And allowing us to have better information to separate people, even if not perfectly. Yes, a couple of people will go out and they'll spread it. As long as R is less than one, it doesn't matter. And that's the crucial conceptual leak that leap that Every, all of our public authorities failed to make. Use the test to slow the spread of the disease. Get R under one. That's all you have to do. And for that, widespread, out there, you do some random sampling. Uh, governments are supposed to provide information. But, you know, test the wastewater and find out where, where are the places where you have a lot, uh, a lot of COVID. You know, basics like that were not done, but we weren't allowed to use tests. We, we are using the we too much. <laughs> we didn't X, we didn't Y. The number one thing is our government did not allow the rest of us to do things that we could have done because people don't want to get this either. Everything uh, John just said, I think it was a brilliant uh, distillation of the issue on uh, tests. Uh, I would put it this way, just to underline, look, uh, John was totally correct. We use a thermometer to test, right? That was allowed, even though it's, an in, it's inaccurate, and it's much less accurate than a paper strip uh, uh, test. But why were we allowed to use a thermometer, but not a paper strip test? Well, simply because the thermometer was approved and created a long time ago, uh, before the FDA had any control. If the thermometer were invented today as a way to test for COVID, the FDA might well have said, no, you cannot use this a device to test for COVID. It's a medical device. It has to go through uh, the approval authority and it's inaccurate. And so we're not going to allow you to use thermometers. Uh, so this became clear to me actually many years ago uh, when we had 23andMe, the DNA company, uh, wanted to uh, 
uh, give people these uh, genetic tests and then tell them uh, what the results were. And the FDA said no. And the issue was not the accuracy of the tests or not that they was reporting, you know, what they were supposed to report. It wasn't a quality, it wasn't a quality control issue. The FDA said, uh, you cannot give this information to uh, people about their own bodies because then they might, you know, make a mistake. They might, you know, take some uh, treatment or something, which they didn't necessarily need. And I was outraged uh, about this, right? Um, because the FDA preventing you from knowing something about your own body. Like what is more anti-libertarian than that? I mean, it's not even putting something into your body, right? Uh, this is actually just simply <clears throat> knowing something about your own body. And so because we had this, uh, I thought it was a free speech issue. You know, I thought uh, 23andMe uh, had rights under the First Amendment to tell you uh, what was the result of your genetic test. I still think that is the case uh, today. Um, and moreover, the unintended consequences of that were when COVID came, the FDA had control of these tests and they said no. And my response was, you know, our antibodies ourselves, right? So this was learning about your own body. I, th I think that that's right, but I think we should we should think about how the CDC and the FDA both screwed this up in, in their own different ways. And, and one thing that I think about a lot is I'm sure everyone uh, or a lot of people at least will remember the CDC had this big plan that they were going to do um, for vaccination where they sort of prior, they rank ordered people and like they, they decided to consider race over age and that became very controversial. They eventually kind of walked that back a little bit. Um, but, you know, why did that happen? And you think about, well, the CDC is originally created to control malaria and then they do and they finish. And if you go back to the early part of the 20th century, you have these, these public health agencies that have enormous amounts of operational capacity, right? They are actually used to having to run quarantines frequently. They're getting measles outbreaks and cholera and typhoid and so forth. And then we clean up the water, we control malaria, we do all of, of, of these jobs. And then they're left with, first of all, things like HIV, which is a problem, but it's, it's actually a fair, you know, it's sexual transmitted diseases um, are relatively hard to get. They don't move as fast as something like an airborne disease. Um, so they, they end up with a different problem to having an airborne pandemic, right? And so we now, it's not that the risk of pandemics has totally gone away. It's like we get them like once every 50 or 100 years. And an agency, what, what is your agency that you have to do this do in between then, now and then, right? Um, so what they did was they picked up a bunch of diff other different jobs, um, which were a little softer, a, less, a little less obviously infectious disease. And, and they lost the operational capacity. And so one of the things, other than the fact that this, this kind of political agenda ended up wrapped into um, the, the, you know, their, their vaccination plans and made them controversial and, and kind of, I think, undercut uh, support for the vaccine a little bit, is that operationally their plan was incredibly complicated. It involved like prioritizing essential workers on the grounds that those essential workers would be, um, you know, more likely to be uh, brown, black, or uh, poor, but they were actually younger. They were leaving the most vulnerable members of those communities still unprotected because those are the seniors in those communities. But also like, how do you know? How do you get the information? How do you contact their bosses? How do you tell people, right? If you have a senior, it's really easy. Everyone has a, a card that has their age on it, right? Their, their birthday. So th there were like, they didn't think about operationally, which is easier to execute because they haven't had to do that kind of work. And similarly with the FDA, you know, they're originally created to keep patent medicine manufacturers from either getting people hooked on opium or poisoning them. And then, you know, they finish that job. And then the job starts to creep because precisely because the agency is left without something to do. And it turns out that sometimes actually it's still necessary to have this high speed decision making capacity that they had in the beginning and have completely lost. And I think that that is something that we're, we, we need to look at going forward in, in this pandemic is when you when you have rare events, how do you maintain operational capacity uh, against extremely rare events. And that's, by the way, a problem for the private sector as well as the public sector. But the public sector, I think, dropped the ball because it was so much less responsive than the private sector.
Well, that tees up the next part of our conversation really nicely. Uh, so thanks for that, Megan. Uh, we've talked a lot so far about innovation and about um, kind of allocation of, of the vaccines there. So I want to move on to a slightly different topic, which is preparation. Um, my instincts are that politics is pretty ill-suited to preparing for these types of um, high-risk, low-probability events, due in part to electoral incentives. Um, and it's only kind of when threats actually occur, when the emergency hits, that there's rewards for, for acting. Um, but then we have the issue that politicians potentially might just fight the last war, uh, which is what uh, stood Korea and some other countries in good stead for this crisis, but might not necessarily be um, exactly how we need to prepare for the, for the next one. Um, Kent Jones kind of asks a question on our uh, question submissions, which kind of builds on this theme, which is really, as a, you know, as a society, how much should we be willing to pay to prepare for these types of events? And I would just add to that, you know, what can we realistically do, given we don't know what the exact contours of the next threat is going to look like? So I'll come to you uh, first, Alex. Yeah, so it's a really difficult problem because, uh, as you said, uh, human beings in general are not good at these uh, small probability, very bad, uh, rare uh, events. And governments probably even uh, worse so. Uh, and it's not just the government's fault. You've got to blame the voters, too. Uh, you know, the voters reward politicians for responding to a crisis, you know, with aid, not for avoiding the crisis uh, in the first place, right? When you avoid the crisis, it doesn't happen. You know, rarely is anybody going to be uh, rewarded for that. Um, one of the problems which I found when, you know, our group is going around telling governments, listen, you got to do some spending here on uh, vaccines. And uh, the governments were just totally unprepared to do this. And this surprised uh, even, even, even me. And one of the reasons was there was no button that you could push. So we had from the 2008, 2009 crisis, you know, a button like on unemployment insurance, you know, extend unemployment insurance, you know, send out checks. We could do that. And that indeed was done to a huge, tremendous extent. Um, but there was no button uh, to push on uh, funding vaccines. So like Operation Warp Speed, literally had to basically steal money from other parts of the budget, you know, never got like big congressional money. Uh, and Operation Warp Speed was just trying to, you know, accumulate as much as you possibly uh, could from other areas uh, of the budget, even though Operation Warp Speed was probably the biggest benefit to cost uh, ratio, uh, maybe, you know, since World War II. Um, so one possible thought, and I don't know if this is any good, this could, it may be a bad idea, there's certainly lots of problems with it, is like a pandemic trust fund or a more, more generally a disaster uh, trust fund. And this could be actually purely nominal, like the Social Security trust fund. Uh, you know, the Social Security trust fund is just government bonds. So you could put at no cost some government bonds into a disaster trust fund. And then at least there would be a a button to push, hey, this is what this is for, you know, we get to push it now. Uh, you know, clearly with political incentives being what they were, what, what they are, uh, that could be abused, it might not work. But the Social Security Trust Fund, oddly enough, appears to have worked. Um, you know, it, it hasn't been rated very much uh, over 70, uh, 80 years. Uh, so maybe a disaster uh, trust fund might help a little bit on the margin. Uh, John, a disaster trust fund, do you think um, on the margin that would would be a significant help? Well, no, actually, because money has not been the problem. Uh, figuring out what to do with it has been the problem. Uh, our government has come up with, I think, $7 trillion, are we up to, of new money thrown at this like fertilizer. Very little of it where it, it matters, <laughs> uh, but, but coming up with money hasn't been the problem. This last war analogy, I think, is, is an important one. Um, there is the tendency to fight the last war, and I think that's particularly dangerous. Um, there is a tendency among politicians and, and everybody to justify what we did last time and therefore to say this is the important thing. Notice how we responded to the recession here was with a, a, a bailouts and stimulus that were much larger than last time. So all of the, gee, that was a bad idea, we need to figure out another way, went by the wayside. And I think, unfortunately, um, you know, what, what they'll do next time, which will come sooner than we think with a pandemic that's worse than this one, uh, 
will be what we what we need to do is lock down the economy and throw money that perhaps next time we won't have uh, at it. Uh, we um, it, it's not just about preparing for the new one. It's it's about maintaining not new knowledge, maintaining old knowledge. There were lots of pandemic plans, uh, as Megan pointed out. There was lots of knowledge of how to do this. Uh, which was lost. California had a, a mobile hospital ready to go after uh, H1N1, uh, ready to go, uh, which we really could have used in the hospital surge. But it turned out that it was uh, for about five million bucks worth of supplies. The whole thing uh, fell apart. The five million bucks went to financing the high speed train. So just keeping alive old knowledge is, I think, the hard part. Now, given that uh, we'll be preparing to fight the last war and and things inevitably will fall apart, I think the only hope is to have flexibility in our plans, which is where we've gone uh, before. To, to have a, th there were at least 12 detailed government plans about what to do in a pandemic. <laughs> Interestingly, none of them cited any of the other ones and they all stayed on the shelf. So the natural thing is an inquiry commission that'll have a plan, uh, but I think that one will just be on the shelf next time. So what do you need? You need flexibility. That's, you know, we went into World War II with uh, horrible um, military equipment completely uh, un unready, but the U.S. was at the time flexible and, and able within a year to produce, um, you know, planes that actually flew and tanks that didn't blow up. Um, so uh, we need to be flexible uh, next time. And um, there, let me let me start putting our, our libertarian hat on. <laughs> uh, reliance on, on markets, on people uh, it, to, to come up with the right things, I think, should be part of our flexibility plan. Operation Warp Speed was the one great thing that our government uh, did. But why was it needed? Why, you know, you don't need to, uh, Elon Musk doesn't need government subsidies to make rocket ships for Mars. Why do we need government subsidies to produce uh, vaccines, which are, as Alex says, all you need to know about cost benefit analysis is, is trillions is more than billions. Uh, and this was in the billions category, which is easy to raise. Well, the answer is because everybody knows, come up with a vaccine and the government is gonna monopolize the supply of it, fix the price of it, is like the Europeans gonna be haggling over couch change while trillions of dollars of GDP are going down and you won't get to make the profit off of it. If vaccines could be sold on a free market after they were developed, you would have a rush to create vaccines and we would have needed anybody's Operation Warp Speed in the first place. Uh, so uh, throughout, this is what we do. When there's a crisis, you, they, they put price caps on toilet paper. Next thing you know, no toilet paper around and nobody investing in toilet flexible toilet paper supply. So I think that the, the only hope is not better government plans. Yes, try to work to maintain some of the state capacity on things we know how to do. But flexibility, both in our bureaucracies, who knows how to do that, but uh, that the bureaucratic response has to be to allow flexibility, to allow people to do things that they want to do and, and rely on some markets at some point here. Yeah, it strikes me, John, uh, from what you just said, that, you know, the need for government to provide certain things becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy if we if when private actors uh, provide it, you clamp down on their prices or take over their factories. And I kind of want to build build on this point um, by asking you a question, Megan. A lot of national conservatives, to the extent that there's ideological coherence among the group that call themselves national conservatives, have used this crisis to kind of highlight what they believe is a hollowing out of manufacturing capacity in the US. And they look at some of the problems that we've seen in, to in terms of export controls that have been imposed by various countries and they seem to believe that we should use activist kind of industrial policy to maintain a degree of excess capacity in manufacturing just in case crises like this hit. Now, it strikes me if we knew what the contours of the next crisis um, were going to be, there'd be much cheaper ways of, uh, of thinking and planning ahead, whether that be uh, stockpiling or taking out um, options, diversifying your trade agreements or coming to some sort of international agreement in terms of um, uh, avoiding uh, future sick and thy neighbor uh, trade policies. But I got the sense from your econ talk that you're a bit more sympathetic, perhaps, to the conser national conservative case than I am. So why don't you give us the kind of steel man version of that? And then we'll let uh, Alex and John respond. Sure. I mean, I, I should say it, it, it's a very limited sympathy. But, uh, you know, to go to the World War II analogy, right? What is the thing that enables us to do that? It's that America was before that, just the manufacturing leader of the world. We had enormous manufacturing capacity, which is why when after Japan bombed us, famously a Japanese official said, 
uh, I fear that we have have wakened a terrible giant. We were the terrible giant precisely because we had all of this uh, manufacturing capacity that Japan couldn't keep up. You know, we are now outsourcing a lot of our manufacturing to a strategic rival um, that has got, grown increasingly restive and that not only bought up our supply of some key uh, protective equipment, then refused to export any to us uh, at the height, you know, when things were worst in, in, in the spring. So, um, I don't exactly blame them. I think we, you know, we did some of this too. Every country did. Every country, the minute they needed masks and they didn't have them, they stopped them from being exported. So one thing I would say is, first of all, just that this has revealed the limits to the idea of kind of total free trade and, and borderless ec economics is wh when something goes really wrong, the borders go back up. And there's, I don't think, I, I might rue that. I might argue like from my heart that it would be more efficient if we did it a different way. Um, I think, but it's, that's not gonna win the day. So we do have to think about as libertarians, what is it like to live in that world where if we have a really far flung global supply chain, that supply chain will in times of crisis for the things that we need most be interrupted, guaranteed. Um, and how do we think about then meeting those challenges? And I think of this in terms of, yes, yeah, stockpiling is great, but as you say, that's best if you know what the next crisis is gonna be. It's also quite expensive, right? Maintaining all of these stockpiles, most of which will not get used for a bunch of different potential crises um, is gonna be a, a heavy political lift. Um, so I think we also have to think about that, but I think about maintaining adaptive capacity. Right. The United States in 1940 had a lot of adaptive capacity because it had all of the machinists. It had, you know, it's not building the physical plant. The U.S. can do that. It is having the people who know how to do these tasks. Um, that said, I think there are real arguments against it, too. And, and to raise a few of the obvious ones in general, the kind of state promoted industries tend to be bad. Um, you know, there are exceptions, I will say, like 19th century Germany. Industrial policy worked. I'm embarrassed to admit it, but it did. But in most cases, industrial policy is really bad and it produces a lot of hidebound industries that aren't very competitive without the all of the protections you give them in order to make them competitive. Um, the other thing I, I would say is that, you know, by doing that, you, you sacrifice other alternatives, obviously, um, and you you get the government involved in ways that can actually be really counterproductive, not just because the, the industry is getting protected, but to give an example of somewhere where, where the United States was the world leader in producing adaptive capacity for this particular crisis was the, our pharmaceutical industry, which is phenomenally innovative, and it is phenomenally innovative um, you know, precisely because the United States provides the profit margin on a lot of drugs, provides these excess profits because we don't have price controls unlike every other rich country. And so you, you can make a huge number of profits on your drugs and companies are tooled around that. Even companies that aren't located here, right? They assume that when they develop a drug, they're, they're going to get an excess share of their profits from the United States. And that created this huge infrastructure that was then able to quickly and flexibly respond to the need for vaccines without the United States not intervening, not having price controls, not attempting to like, to, you know, push where the industry was going, we might not, the world might not have had that, that capacity. And when you get the government involved, you often see that like, you know, yes, I want to be in it, but then I want to price control your product. I want to have 97 different rules about how you do things that makes those industries less fast and flexible. So I'm not sure there's a solution to the problem. I am merely more sympathetic to the idea that for some key strategic things, both um, on the military side and in, you know, sort of public health stuff, there might be an argument for trying to maintain some capacity here. But that said, we had a company in the United States that could have made more N95 masks. All they needed was a guaranteed purchase order to make them whole on the cost of buying the equipment to make the masks. But because Donald Trump didn't like masks, that didn't happen. And I think that is a problem the government could have solved. There were huge spillover effects to making more uh, to making more masks. It would have been cheap at you know 80 times the price that it would have cost us. Buy all the machines you can get. Just start pumping them out until you, people are getting N95 masks with a box of cornflakes. That would have been a good trade. And that is the the final sort of caveat about government, right? Is that if if it depends on whether the president likes an incredibly effective intervention um, or thinks it makes him look politically weak, is whether you get that good policy outcome. You should be very very skeptical 
and pinning your hopes on that to save you, um, you know, through industrial policy or anything else. Hmm. <laughs> Ryan, Ryan, you're Brian, you're muted. Ryan, we can't hear you. Oh, sorry, sorry about that. I was just saying, um, there's a sure it was brilliant. It was brilliant. Uh, there's an implicit assumption, I think, in what you're saying that the next crisis won't more uh, adversely affect the domestic economy more than the international supplier. So, just to give a quick example, because Scott Linsicum would never forgive me if I didn't bring this up, there were times during this pandemic where COVID was so prevalent that um, truck manufacturers were, you know, just had to stop operations. Um, in Germany at the time, the disease was much less prevalent and they were churning out trucks. If we'd have had those trading relationships and hadn't uh, protected uh, the, the truck production industry, um, then in that case, we would have been perhaps more resilient in terms of being able to continue um, the sales and production of trucks. But that that's by the by. Let's... Um, Let's move on to a couple of, of questions in regard this um, from from the audience. So just picking up on what uh, Megan said, uh, John, uh, Dan B asks, so what role should a federal government have for a pandemic in a libertarian society? Um, I think he's alluding to the fact we're talking about getting out of the way of tests, treatments and vaccines. Uh, but what role should the federal government have beyond that? And the same question for state and city governments. Um, another questioner kind of links into what Alex says and talks about the experimentation. Um, he then asks, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to you, Alex, after John, he then asks, does that mean that um, you're suggesting that a lot more of these consequential decisions should be made at a, a state and local level, so we got even more experimentation from there? So John, your kind of libertarian vision uh, for what to do in a pandemic, and then Alex, the role of um, state experimentation within the United States. So I hope someday we'll get to come back and, and maybe over a beer have a discussion with Megan about uh, how much industrial policy do you need to actually stop a pandemic and how badly all this goes wrong and is heading to going wrong right now. But uh, yes, we need to leave that behind. Um, so I think we're all um, state capacity libertarians, not just anarchists. And I think this is an interesting case because public health is one of the places that, that there is such a thing as public goods and externalities. And you need, uh, what do you need? Libertarian is not anarchist. And, you know, you need property rights, a good court system, um, uh, rule of law, um, uh, we're all in there. And, and competent public health is one of the things uh, we would like uh, as libertarians. Um, certainly, you know, at the first stages, uh, somebody sh needs to be in charge of uh, testing, tracing, seeing what's going on. Uh, that's that's the we're not supposed to handle pandemics with economic lockdowns and stimulus. We're supposed to handle them with competent uh, public health. So uh, I think that is uh, the core of, of what we ask governments to do. Now, after that, uh, you know, the level of government interventions in the economy, I think made the economy a whole lot worse. That's pretty clear and didn't help the pandemic. <laughs> uh, so um, I, I, I've written about, you know, for example, had even the hardest cases, vaccines, uh, had they been at least, should we, can we allow a free market on top of the government allocations of vaccines rather than saying, you know, even if you by getting a vaccine can reopen your business, re-employ 300 people and contribute a million dollars to GDP, you may not get the vaccine at any price. So allowing a market in vaccines on top of state allocation, allowing people to use tests uh, as they see fit, allowing uh, you know state and local governments to experiment with different ways to try to contain it, um, you know, that that's the heart of, of libertarianism. And I think that's that would have gotten us a much quicker response. We could have gotten on top of the the challenge of evolution and exponential growth, which faces us still. This is not over. <coughs> um, evolution is still uh, is still out there. Um, so I think at, uh, I'll stop there. But I think that basic vision uh, remains intact and, and we could have gotten rid of the disease much quicker. 
uh, thanks to the miracle of, of vaccines, which uh, uh, is not a government provided thing. Uh, and uh, and we could also have done this with one, I don't know how many zeros to put it, how much less economic damage uh, could have been done. Uh, you know, we, historically, we've had much worse pandemics come and go uh, without the catastrophic effect on GDP, uh, people's health, well-being, and our public finances. I'll just say for the record that I probably wouldn't call myself a state capacity libertarian because I think the measures of state capacity that um, at least were undertaken prior to the crisis, um, don't really appear to have correlated well with um, with performance in the pandemic. And I think it becomes a bit of a tautology. I agree with Brian Kaplan on this. If we're saying that, you know, what we need is more state capacity um, because we've done badly in the pandemic and then ask how can we judge state capacity? It's performance in the pandemic. It, you know, it's a, it's a bit circular. Um, Alex, do you have any, uh, any thoughts on, on that? I just want to quickly clarify. Uh, I agree. Yeah, cool. Using, using bu buzzwords is is really difficult, but any without there's a whole state capacity thing. I think what libertarian means is you do need a small, limited, competent, effective government that can handle the basics of 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 public health and and a court system and and rule of law and 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 uh, and, and so forth. So I, I may have misused a term, uh, but please, Alex, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, just to uh, underline that and what Megan said earlier, look, the CDC was spending all of this money on preventing vaping, which in itself was a stupid thing to do because it probably saves lives. But the fact that the CDC was so diverted from their reason to etra, you know, uh, pandemics and then failed in the pandemics, that was, you know, a failure of state capacity, uh, however you want to put it. On the question that I was asked about... Um, diversity and, and exploration, I, I am disturbed at, you know, we almost have like a world government uh, today, uh, not because there's any uh, uh, hegemon, but because the intellectual class is so similar across all countries in the world that they almost all follow very, very similar policies with very little experimentation. I mean, it is shocking to me that the British were the only ones to uh, support uh, human challenge trials. Uh, you know, I was talking about human, shouting about human challenge trials from early, early on, and only the British, and only very, very late. Um, so should should we have more uh, diversity at the state level? Of course we should. But again, in the United States, we call ourselves a federalist country, but it's a lie. It's no longer true. Um, all of the uh, innovation and entrepreneurship and capacity has been drained from the state uh, governments. And they all look to the federal government uh, to tell them what to do. State governments could have done, could have delayed the second dose. Um, none of them uh, have. They could have tried different uh, policies. Uh, none of them have. Uh, the state and local governments were completely unprepared uh, to run vaccinations. And after being told Months and months, you know, in advance, the, the vaccines are coming, the vaccines are coming. And yet at the very beginning, when they came in December, the state governments and the local governments are like, but we don't have the money, which was total nonsense, which is a complete lie. Of course, the state and local governments are spending a trillion dollars and they couldn't find a way to divert, you know, uh, some resources from something of low value to something like vaccines. Oh, no, no, no. You know, everything that we're doing is so important. Right. So all of the state and local governments, they all look to the federal government for energy and initiative. And because, uh, as Megan pointed out, the Trump administration just had the wrong energy, the wrong initiative, the anti-testing, anti-masks, um, and Trump was just diverted into anything else but the pandemic. Right. You know, he was certainly not a the leader that you wanted uh, in a uh, pandemic. And it turned out that because the federal government and especially the presidency, Congress has also just been nowhere in this whole thing, right? Uh, it all had to do with the president. And because the president was making ro the wrong decisions, we all suffered uh, because of that. Some great points. Um, somebody actually asked me in the question, given my British accent, to, to comment on why I think the UK might have been a bit different. Um, I think one reason is a relatively new regulatory agency, you know, repatriated a bunch of powers 
post Brexit. So perhaps there were le- there was less kind of institutional inertia, and also the country had been suffering a pretty bad um, double hit of a, a very sharp economic downturn, and also, of course, a very high death toll as well. So necessity sometimes is the uh, the mother of innovation uh, and invention. There are two massive elephants in the room here that we haven't talked about, and I'm conscious of the fact that we're drastically running out of time. Um, the debate that animates many libertarians the most is the the issue of lockdowns and and kind of looking across states, the evidence that um, lockdowns are an effective means of um, controlling this virus is perhaps not as clear cut as um, many public health experts uh, seem to suggest. So, uh, Megan, I'll start with you. I mean, what's your reading of the kind of marginal impact of of lockdowns and uh, how well they actually did what was advertised? Uh, I think it's marginal. It's more marginal than you might, than I think a lot of certainly non-libertarians would expect. Um, You know, in general, what it looks like is that people kind of modified their behavior to keep uh, the, the R, the transmission rate to around one. And when it rose, people stayed home, people got scared and stayed home. When it fell, people felt confident and went out. Um, I don't think, I think the kind of talking more that I do hear from some of my more, um, enthusiastically libertarian and conservative commentators is that lockdowns do nothing. And I just think that's got to be false, (laughs) right? I mean, like you're at that point, you're kind of arguing with the laws of physics. I think shutting down large indoor spaces where people congregate is probably going to on net reduce transmission. It's obviously going to be offset to whatever extent people then just crowd into their houses and have parties. But it also, I think, sends a signal about behavior. Um, And I think it's somewhat hard to disentangle that, right? In part because you've got these these real uh, co-foundings, confoundings, which is that the um, latitude is obviously somewhat connected to transmission. We are not quite clear on what the root of that is. It might be related to sun or something else. Um, And Southern states tended to be more open than Northern states. And so there's all of these, it's, it's, it's incredibly difficult to untangle causality, but I think that you know, what might have actually been more effective looking backwards um, is to say, like, shut down really big things, right? You you shut down, you allow outdoor soccer matches or protests or whatever, but you say, you know what, if you've got a 5,000 person concert venue or indoor sporting venue, um, you know, it's April, we're we're not going to allow that to happen. That would have sent the same signal and I think probably, you know, boosted Um, But I realize that for a lot of libertarians, this is very controversial. And I will just say this is that like, for me, this is stuff I've been saying for 20 years. And I would say, uh, you know, when I when I criticize public health, which I do a lot, but that's not, you know, infectious disease control is different. That's something where there's a clear externality. The government should intervene to shut it down. And I think that blocking large transmission points where you can have massive super spreader events is a legitimate exercise of government power. Um, I don't know that we did that effectively. I certainly don't think attribute like everything to policy. You would have to be crazy to do that. Just you can, I mean, you can eyeball the difference between like Florida and North Dakota and just see like, well, you know, they both kind of had similar policies and one had much worse outcomes. It's obviously not just the policy that is, is driving this here. John. Yeah. Um, so lockdowns uh, achieved something at enormous cost. And uh, I, I, I think we should remember Alex's trillions is more than billions here. Um, Megan is right. There's an externality here. Uh, so in fact, uh, some restrictions on behavior make sense. Now, the, the surprising thing, of course, in the study of lockdowns is people on their own don't want to get sick. And and to what extent do you need to control the externality? Uh, to what extent are people out there saying, well, I don't care if I get sick and, and actually spreading it to someone else? We saw evidence of, you know, people stopped flying long before governments stopped the lockdowns. Um, it is a paradox that our government, what it knows how to do is tell business to close. It doesn't know how to tell people to stop having parties. And so the right, the, the two things that I, I wrote early on in this that I'm, I'm proudest of being early on, uh, one is the, the reopen smart thing. 
the, what we need is here are the five behaviors that will cause trouble for this disease. And remember, it's largely a super spreading event. It's airborne transmission. So what we really need to do is large indoor events with poor ventilation uh, need, need, need to be stopped. And, and don't go, guys. Now, to, do we, to what extent do we need to lock down business? But we just shut down all business. And, and and we didn't like the Europeans. The Europeans told people stay home, which at least we're enough libertarian American. We didn't do that, but we locked down all all business and the cost of doing that relative business, as opposed to saying here are the ways that you can run a business. Most businesses that I've watched the pandemic have actually been much more cautious than uh, the government rules. It's not even clear those rules were necessary, as opposed to just information on here's to run a, a business and not get sued. But you know, why do you lock down an auto body paint shop? where everybody wears respirators anyway. Well, that's the sort of thing we did. So a blanket business lockdown, I think, achieved um, achieved some reduction in events that had a reproduction rate of 0.02 <laughs> at enormous economic cost, as opposed to getting the super spreader events down and even thinking about the economic cost uh, involved. So there was a way to, to, smart, to smart open uh, and um, there was a way to pay attention and, and and there was a lot of uh, uh, let give people the information and they will make up their own minds that that could this could have been done at far, far less cost. And, and trillions are serious amounts of money. Yeah, I agree with everything uh, that uh, John uh, just said. It's very good to be out libertarian, by the way, on a, on a panel. Uh, I'm really pleased about that. <laughs> um, let, let me just say two things about lockdowns. There's sort of, I think, two really two good cases, or the two best cases for for lockdowns. Uh, one is right at the very beginning, okay, where you actually have a chance to uh, push R below one, uh, get testing out there, and get control of the pandemic before uh, it takes off. The problem with that, of course, is that if you do it early when you should do it, people are going to complain. Well, I don't see any deaths. Why are we doing this? There's only been 100 deaths. You know, are you crazy or you're locking down the entire economy for 100 deaths? That's insane. So it's very, very difficult to do. But that is one case where that's the best one of the best cases. What's the second best case uh, for the lockdown? That's actually right now. That's actually right before the vaccines are uh, available, right? So you, you kind of want to, you, you know, uh, when, the, when the vaccine, when the troops are coming, uh, you know, the next day, right? When the, the reserve forces are about to uh, join uh, the battle, uh, you really want to hold off on those deaths because you can then avoid those deaths uh, completely. Uh, the problem, of course, with that is what we're seeing now is people are sick of it. People are just sick of it, right? Uh, and they don't want to do a, uh, a a lockdown. It's you know they're they're tired. They've been having these on and off now for uh, over a year. Um, so politically, whether a optimal lockdown right at the beginning or right at the end, I both of these have real political problems, and uh, those are the best cases, and they're hard to do. Yeah, I think you've made a crucial kind of implicit point there, which is that lockdown is not some sort of homogenous policy. It's context and time specific. Um, we've run out of time. I'm conscious of the fact there's a hell of a lot of questions, but I'm, af I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to get to all of them. Um, so I'd just like to kind of ask each of you just perhaps for one minute, just any final thoughts on the economics of the pandemic and, and where we might go from here. So let's start with um, with, with Megan. Uh, yeah, we haven't talked about stimulus at all, um, or, or only very incidentally. And I, I suspect that everyone on this panel agrees, um, certainly that we did too much. Um, you know, I personally think that as a kind of regulatory taking, paying the people that were forced to stay home, uh, unemployment and so forth was a good was good policy. Uh, both on a moral level um, and on an economic level. Um, but I think at this point, you know, we we are just spending money like it's going out of style. We're not thinking about the cost benefit on any of it. And we've left ourselves with a giant debt overhang that we are actually going to have to deal with. And rather than talking about how we're going to deal with it, we're talking about how can we spend even more money. Um, I find that fairly terrifying. Um, I sort of worry that we are 
now getting into a kind of political economy where everyone has just concluded we're going to go bankrupt. So we might as well enjoy ourselves on the way out. Um, and I think that that is something that we are going to need to reckon with in the fairly near future. Let me leave with this uh, point. For many years, I've been talking about the invisible graveyard. And the invisible graveyard is where people are buried who would have lived had the FDA uh, acted sooner and had the FDA uh, not had so many uh, costs for getting new drugs uh, approved. One of the perhaps only silver linings of the crisis is that now more and more people are seeing the invisible graveyard. It used to be you had to have practice seeing the invisible hand <laughs> before you could see the invisible graveyard. Uh, but now even people at the New York Times, you know, are questioning uh, the FDA. And the thing about the invisible graveyard, it doesn't just apply to the people who died of COVID. For people who have cancer and for people who have heart disease and for people who have AIDS, they are in exactly the same position which all of us are in uh, now, waiting for a uh, cure. And the invisible graveyard is very visible to them. And I hope now that we can all see that there is a cost. There's a cost to being too safe. You could be too safe. There's a cost to doing, uh, you know, requiring more and more clinical trials. There is a cost to FDA delay. And I hope now that more people see that. So I'll, I'll just add a couple things. We need to remember the costs of fighting the pandemic were billions and the economics uh, that was sent out was trillions. <laughs> Alex, the trillions is greater than billions is a very important principle. We could have spent a lot more on actually fighting the pandemic usefully. Uh, the, uh, the Where did the $7 trillion go? Uh, Megan's exactly right. It is right and just for a government to, uh, government is sort of insurer of last resort. Uh, pe you know, re people who lost their jobs, um, some unemployment insurance is exactly the right thing. But that has now morphed into stimulus. And uh, stimulus is the, uh, the idea that it's always 1933 and that the way to get an economy going is to throw money out the window. Uh, for example, to write checks to every single uh, American under $100,000 a year of income. So a government worker who is staying at home, whose job is completely secure, nonetheless gets a check. Why do we do this? Um, well, I think because we can. We're writing checks to registered voters, basically. If there's any intellectual grounds, it's the, it's the Keynesian stimulus idea that this is how we get an economy going, which is insane. The economy is, is, is not running because it's shut down. You can give people as much money as you want in the middle of a pandemic. They're not going to go to restaurants. They're not going to go to air, air travel, even if it's allowed. Uh, so we are now in, in the deep uh, deep stimulus part of it, which is is completely pointless to the task at, at hand. And unfortunately is going to be, I think, the lesson. The other thing that happened, which we haven't talked about, is the bailout. Um, uh, we went into this with a, uh, the, the Federal Reserve started buying treasuries, um, bailed out the airlines this time around, insured, uh, put a floor under all corporate bond um, issues. Uh, so trillions, of dollars there to prop up markets. Um, remember, we did this once before and then we swore never, never again. Even the money market mutual funds got bailed out. Uh, so why was there a second financial bailout? Now, ex post, we did, this did not turn into a financial crisis and it could have. Uh, wave of industries could have gone bankrupt. This could have been much worse. But how did we get into the situation where uh, a, a massively larger bailout than 2008 happened? Um, and and where is the outrage? Where is the Dodd Frank? Where is the Commission saying, okay, we did it again, but how are we not going to every time ramp up trillions more and trillions more into the financial system every time there's a problem? So uh, unfortunately, that's two parts of the last war that I think we're going to either we're going to write in history as wonderful is that the Fed threw uh, trillions of dollars into the financial markets and the um, federal government threw trillions of dollars at voters, uh, all of it completely, uh, well, the first possibly useful, but a real good question as to why and, and most of the uh, other stuff uh, just sending money uh, uh, pointlessly as far as either the pandemic or the economy. Great. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Um, this is obviously the economics of this pandemic is obviously a, a massive um, uh, subject and uh, thank our panelists in the usual way for um, for, for outlining their thoughts. Um, there's so much more to talk about. If if you want to kind of explore some more of the issues of the pandemic, um, 
there, there's much more in the book, um, Economics in One Virus, an Introduction to Economic Reasoning Through COVID-19, which, as I um, kind of outlined at the start of this, uh, is available to be purchased at the Cato store and on Amazon and a range of other bookstores. So thank you for, for tuning in today to the um, this Cato Institute book forum. And we look forward to having you back to discuss more issues to do with the pandemic and public policy in the near future. Thank you.